Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to our first ever Find Your Path um, Pi alumni chat. And our first alumni, his name is Mike Rockwell. Yay! Um, Mike is an alum of both Pite and EEB, which you can definitely see in the email I sent. Um, he did ConBio and Pite for his specialization. And uh, he did a study abroad experience through School for Field Studies um, when people could study abroad <laughs> in Australia. And post-graduation, he moved to Seattle, uh, got a job in Earth Corps, and has since um, had several different positions and also started up a, a nitro brewing company, Zuga Nitro Brew. Um, so that's kind of cool, right? Little nitro in your coffee and your lemonade. Yeah. So everybody, um, I'd like to introduce Mike Rockwell and take it away. If do you have any like introductory things you want to talk about yourself, like what position are you in right now? Um, I guess you took it away. You introduced me better than I ever could have. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and just answer all your questions. I remember when I was graduating and getting ready to leave school and enter the, the real world and how freaky that was. And hopefully something I can say today can help someone through that. So yeah, excited to be here. Thank you. Okay, so um, the way this is kind of set up is we're going to do some popcorn questions between the Pite staff to Mike that students have put together that through other iterations of these type of panels. We usually have panels, but we're doing one-on-ones this time that students want to know the answers to. So my first question that is student-derived is what topics or classes were you interested in when you came to college? So when I came to college, um, I was super jazzed about um, evolutionary ecology, actually. Um, I, in high school, I, I wanted to be an architect for like most of high school. And then I took AP Bio and it just rocked my world. And I loved um, evolution. I saw that there was a major for that, EEB, and declared it after like my first semester, I think. So, yeah. Cool, cool. Chris, you're up. So what got you interested in the current field? Yeah, so this will probably resonate with a lot of people, but I watched way too much Steve Irwin growing up. Um, I was obsessed with um, wildlife and rainforest conservation and like planet Earth and BBC and um, was just kind of following that passion. Um, when I uh, came to college, I knew I loved wildlife and wanted to find a way to um, kind of make a career out of that. And I just kind of followed the steps to Pite. Um, what was your dream job when you were an undergrad or what kind of specific career goals did you have looking post-graduation? Yeah, so looking back at it, um, I wish I'd probably had some more specific goals. Um, I think I, at the time, I just wanted to find a job in uh, wildlife uh, in wildlife conservation. Um, had no idea how complicated that career path was and all of the hurdles involved with that. Um, so it's definitely like been a journey. And also as I've wandered through that journey. It's also brought me to kind of other paths and other interests as well. So um, yeah, come a long way since then. If you were an undergrad in today's world, <clears throat> which is such a relevant question, what would you do differently to prepare for your career? Yeah, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I think um, biggest thing is just having a clear, clearer vision um, when I went into college of what I wanted to get out of it. Um, I think I was just kind of in that pipeline. You graduate high school, you go to college, you uh, find some interest, you major in it, and then you get a real job. And I think since then I've learned the importance of kind of beginning with the end in mind and having a purpose behind um, that, both to like 
drive you and give you motivation while you're at school, but also so when you leave, you know you're working towards something. I think I was kind of fell into that traditional model of follow your passions. And then I did that and I graduated and I was like, well, crap, I'm so passionate about a lot of things and I still don't know how to make money and like put a house, put a roof over my um, head um, following my passions. So I think that, and then I, to be blunt, I wouldn't have gone to U of M my first two years. I would have gone to a community college because student loans suck and you have to start paying them eventually. So. Yeah, probably not the most happy answer, but that's the truth. Real talk. Nope. Chris. Sure. Yeah, it's not always an easy one. Yeah. So kind of going on the flip side of that, with environment being such a broad field <clears throat> and a lot of students having, especially in Pite, having minors, double majors, various interests even within environment, what would you recommend to those students who aren't sure what they necessarily want to do after graduation? Yeah. Um, my biggest, I guess my advice would be twofold. Um, one, talk to people that are already doing things you're interested in. Um, something that I did after I graduated, I did a lot of informational interviews. I actually talked to like, I think almost like half of the Pite faculty, um, that winter. And I, anything involved in the environment at all from the um, landscape design and like urban planning department. I talked to Joe, head of the herb program. Um, I talked to one of my favorite professors, Mark Hunter, who did the, um, was it ecosystem ecology class and talked because those are people that have already specialized and figured out what they loved about the environment and getting to talk to them about what they were passionate about was really cool. I walked through the landscape architect studio and was like, this is really cool, but I don't think it's for me. Um, and that's awesome. Like that's a great, um, that's something that's great to realize. Um, so yeah, talk to people that are more experienced and smarter than you and see what they're willing to tell you. And then I'd say second is just start trying things. I think we can get into this kind of choice paralysis of I love so many things. I wanna go like design a new wind turbine and I wanna save the uh, sea turtles in Florida and I'm gonna go like, but all of those things, like they're just interests until you start doing something. So. Um, something that I did um, once I graduated, I actually got a, um, it was from one of these talks, uh, Kyle Rora at Ducks Unlimited. I did a internship with them. It was a political, environmental political. I was like scheduling one of their events. And I realized through that, that the environmental politics is not the world for me. I was, felt like I didn't have the personality for it. I did the job that they hired me to do. I scheduled the event and it went really great. But at the end I was like, cool, try that out. Don't want to do that. And then I went on to do other things. But I guess my biggest advice is like, just try things because you're not going to know what you like and what you don't like until, until you've done it. That's a really great segue into kind of the next topic, which is networking. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more on what networking has meant uh, for you in your career and beyond informational interviews, which is a great tool. How can students network? Yeah, I think, I think the word networking has such a negative connotation. Um, but I think a majority of the networking that I've done is, I guess I call it like opportunistic, but essentially you are working with someone who has experience in the industry or is um, coming from a diff essentially you're talking to people with different backgrounds from you. Um, and it, I think it comes from a place of curiosity. You know, it's, you're not sitting down with an agenda. You want to, you want them to like you on LinkedIn and you want to like become best friends and have coffee. Like it just starts with a conversation um with the base of curiosity asking them 
why they do what they do and why they enjoy that. And um, so I think that just kind of internal. Um, I know when I moved to Earth Corps, I was a, a crew member um, going out into the field every day. We'd come back to the office every once in a while and um, we'd interact with the staff. And I uh, asked the leadership director just why they chose the leadership program that they did. And it ended up with this great conversation and we're still uh, great friends uh, today. So I think, yeah, when I think I identify as like an introvert. So I think going from that business mindset of networking is going to this big room with a bunch of people and fancy cocktails and you have to like have your elevator pitch like nailed down. It's like, that's no, no, that's not the type of networking that I want to do. Those aren't really the type of people that I want to be interacting with. Um, but yeah, just talking to people that know cool things and are doing cool stuff. Um, so I guess that's the internal. And then I think external with the informational interviews, we live in the, the internet age. You can look up experts and people that you admire, like with uh, any Google search, you can find emails very easily. And I think my inter informational interview template was essentially, hey, my name's Mike, I just graduated. I'm interested in what you do um, specifically, um, like, and I'd reference something that they had done that, so like read an article that they'd posted or something. Uh, would you have time to sit down and talk about um, what you're doing and how you got there? And I think I had a lot of people not respond, but maybe 50% uh, decided to sit down and talk to me and I learned a lot. So, yeah. Okay. Um, here's kind of a dream question. If you could do undergrad all over again, what experiences or classes would you seek out and why? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think at the time I uh, followed my curiosities and um, I'm pretty happy with like my undergrad experience, but um, with where my, where my interests currently are, um, I'm very interested in uh, sustainable systems and sustainable supply chain. So I'd probably look into that stuff more, but at the time I didn't know that existed or that was a thing that people cared about. So, yeah. To kind of follow up with that, even if you kind of knew it existed, would you have taken the classes? Yeah, probably. I mean, I don't know. Honestly, when I was in school, I was still like trying to save the rainforest. I wanted, um, I was looking for environmental conservation jobs. Well, I was looking for wildlife positions. And I think a lot, my perspective has changed the last three years a lot as I've gotten more experience. And it's, yeah, I think my mindset is just very, very different now. Can you talk a little bit more about how that or why that has changed for you? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think my biggest realization um, after leaving uh, U of M was that um, when I graduated, I'd spent almost my entire life in school. I, from kindergarten through high school, four years at a university, I was very good at absorbing information and learning and like that was the system that I was in and I was trying to maximize my potential within that. Once you graduate, you're in a very different system. You get to decide what you want to learn. You get to decide how you want to apply your knowledge, which is a very different skill set and was very like scary and intimidating for me at first. Um, but I think that's what brought me out to Seattle to do Earth Corps. It was an opportunity to get out of the classroom and stop just talking about um, environmental conservation. Um, but it was the opportunity to literally go out and start planting trees and start removing invasive species and start leading volunteer events with hundreds of 
like middle schoolers from uh, the local area. And I think through that process, um, I've kind of realized, and I guess backtracking to, um, I studied abroad in Australia doing a wildlife conservation program. And I wrote a research paper on tree kangaroos, micro habitat preferences. It was like the coolest experience of my life. But at the end of that program, my biggest takeaway was when it comes to wildlife conservation, the problem aren't the animals, it's the people. So I think at that point I started kind of shifting away from this wildlife focus and wildlife curiosity. And then I started looking into ways that we could get people involved and kind of spread this movement that we're all a part of to the rest of the world. And that brought me to Earth Corps, which is a, a environmental leadership a nonprofit. And that's also what, what's kind of pushing me into a sustainable business um, at the moment, which is really, really weird to say that I'm interested in a, like sustainable business. Cause if you would have asked me that four years ago, I would have like never believed you. I was very like anti-business and now um, in terms of sustainable change, um, climate change is the, and habitat destruction are the biggest threats to wildlife. And you're not gonna change either one of those until we can change human behavior and we can get um, people on our planet to um, live more sustainably so that we can all live here. Yeah. Good stuff. That's what I got. <laughs> Snap. Okay, sorry, Chris De Bogart, you're up, Chris, sorry. Well, that's actually perfect, because, I mean, you talked about it for a lot, brought up a lot of good points, and I don't think I've met a student in Pite who hasn't wanted to go on and change the world. Um, so actually having, you know, experiences of having that idea in college and then going on, actually going to work in positions um, and seeing those changes or making those changes. So what kind of advice do you have for students who have that, you know, I want to save the world. I want to save the rainforest. I want to save X idea while they're in undergrad. Yeah. Um, biggest advice is hold on to that, but start small. Um, I think it's very easy to leave um, to graduate knowing um, having the base knowledge from all of your courses on eco footprints and how unsustainable the world is. And I think that motivates a lot of people to um, invest a lot of energy right off the bat. But I think um, this isn't a, a problem that is gonna be solved overnight. It's a global issue uh, that's gonna take time. Um, and I think um, you just have to play the long game and know that the long game starts somewhere small. It starts as small as going to a volunteer event and planting trees once a month. Um, so yeah, definitely like be patient, get started, but it's okay if you're not seeing your work changing the world instantly. Um, it's, you have to grow your potential the same way that this movement is growing and you're a part of something that's bigger than yourself. And I think that can bring these feelings of powerlessness sometimes, especially when we look at the government and we look at big business and what they're doing. Um, and you think how me as one person can influence that. Um, you have to start small and um, like take care of yourself because um, at the end of the day, you can only give what you have. And if you give everything right off the bat, then you're not gonna have anything to give eventually. So yeah, there's a, one of the uh, directors at EarthCore talks about um, this saucer analogy and you have this, um, this saucer of tea or coffee or whatever, and uh, it's constantly filling up and um, you need to serve people with what's overflowing. Because if you give from what's inside of the saucer, then you're giving, um, it's unsustainable, essentially. If you keep just giving and giving and giving, you'll get burnt out 
and that's not healthy for you and that's not what's healthy for this movement. We have to think in terms of long-term sustainable change and how we're approaching this movement as well as um, the change that we're fighting for. I think that's uh, such a great way to look at it and some really great insight um, that I know all of us can take moving forward. Um, looking into kind of your own future plans, where do you see your career going from here? Yeah, um, I think this is really funny because um, as a uh, college senior, I was at this kind of career um, career shift. I was trying to figure out how to word my resume right and go and get a job in what I was interested in. And I'm also in that place right now. Um, at EarthCorps, I served three AmeriCorps positions. I was crew member, crew leader, and now I'm a habitat restoration specialist, which is essentially a assistant project manager role. Um, and I've essentially maxed out um, the seasonal positions they have. The only place to go at this organization would be to um, get a staff position and those are very hard to find. Um, and um, I think another big thing in terms of like human behavior, um, I've become very interested in the idea of sustainable business. Um, I, uh, and that's because of uh, actually this hobby, this uh, passion for coffee. Um, I moved to Seattle and got bit by the bug. I got a free uh, espresso machine on Buy Nothing and started just messing around with it. And uh, two years later, um, I met the owner of a local coffee roaster uh, called Onda Origins. And their mission is, I'm not gonna quote it perfectly, but it's along the lines of uh, business has caused degradation and destruction across the globe and only business has the power to fix it. And that's essentially saying that um, capitalism as our economic system um, is flawed. Um, we've all learned about it. Um, it doesn't count for externalities such as environmental degradation and pollution and the like. Um, but, and I know, uh, I think this is what's hard for me to realize is that we can't just flip the switch and all of a sudden have a green circular economy that lives within the planet's um, compounds. We need to shift that narrative and seeing how Onda Origins was using their coffee roasting to pay coffee farmers up to 12 times uh, what other roasters pay them um, and how those roasters were using that to uh, preserve rainforests next to their coffee plantations. They're using it to create uh, workers houses, to create community groups, and then also how they were able to use their profits um, during the Black Lives Matter movement in Seattle, and they were able to use those profits to donate to local community-led organizations that were doing um, that work. And I realized that um, money, and this is a really weird thing for, to come out of my mouth, but I don't think money is inherently evil. I think money is powerful. And I think capitalism is inherently selfish, but I think there are also ways for businesses to use their money to do good. And I've seen that through Onda Origins. And that's why my friend and I started a cold brew company. We, um, we it was kind of our quarantine um, hobby. Um, we were just dreaming up a cold brew cart. We called Onda Origins asking for some beans just to mess around with. And they called us back um, saying they loved the idea and wanted to support us in making it a reality. And now we're, we went from just being restorationists to now we co-founded a company that is based around um, uh, local Pacific Northwest produce and coffee and creating this community around um, awareness for where like your coffee and your products come from. Um, so. Yeah, to answer your question, where do I see my career going? 
Um, I'm very interested in sustainable business um, coming up. Um, I'm considering grad school, um, some sort of MS environment, um, MBA dual degree like Herb. And yeah, I'm still following my curiosities and figuring out what I want to do. <laughs> Awesome. Good, good descriptions of things there. Can, I realize as we're going forward, I don't think that you gave us a description of what you currently do. So can you do like a rundown of your current position real quick? Yeah. Um, so I'm a habitat restoration specialist, which is essentially an assistant project management role at Earth Corps. Um, I've um, managed four different projects this year, including a um, cattle exclusion fence in like the rural Skagit River Delta. Um, I managed a cattail removal project up in uh, a intertidal zone. And then I'm also in charge of the uh, Commencement Bay Superfund Collaborative uh, project, which is a uh, network of 15 different Superfund sites. And I, work between the agency contacts and the crews, turning the agency contacts um, restoration wishes um, into opportunities for um, the crews. And I think when I left uh, Pite, I was very interested in the idea of a service year. I always said it was going to be one year and then I'd go back to grad school. Um, here I am three years later, I just um, when you find somewhere that you like and you trust, you stay there. And I think the uh, leadership opportunities at Earth Corps were just hard to pass up. Um, it's not just another restoration company. They use environmental restoration to teach leadership skills through workshops that vary from um, environmental justice to cross-cultural communication to indigenous land rights. And it's kind of this way of um, not just doing the things and um, planting the trees and making the world a better place, but also using that to talk about these bigger issues that um, are really important. Awesome, great. Okay, um, so we're going into um, questions that are kind of like, how do you handle this? Um, so what is time management? Um, how do you juggle your current, right, exactly, has that, has that got better for any of us? No. Um, how do you juggle your current work while trying to pursue your other interests or researching continuing education and things like that? Um, yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I've gotten better at that. Um, my, my biggest thing is um, goal setting and visioning. Um, if you don't write it down, it's not gonna happen. So I have a journal that I write in every morning. Um, it's got my goals for 2020 at the top. Um, I check in on that. Um, also, that's not for everyone, that's totally cool. Um, but I think just finding what works for you, it's kind of a self accountability um, system. Uh, when I was in school, that meant writing sticky notes of every assignment and putting them on my wall and getting to rip them off after I'd like written the paper. Um, but yeah, I think just finding whatever system works for you. Um, and I think also just, I think furthering your education and following your interests is very important. Um, but doing that as well as having a full-time job can be exhausting. So also making sure to like take care of yourself, like eat, exercise, go explore um, in terms of like my interests and um, like thinking of the company when we were, had to go through the creative process of developing our mission and our values. Uh, like I went on a hike and it was incredible just how restorative that was. So I guess, yes, do the things, um, but also like take care of yourself. No. <laughs> um, so one common thing that we always find students always come across when they graduate is running into positions or they want to go do something and they don't have the right experience or they don't necessarily know of resources on how to find those positions. Um, so how did you 
navigate that transition from graduation to finding careers? And do you have any advice for students who might be coming upon that next spring or even this winter? Um, yeah, um, I think it, um, it kind of comes back to that networking piece. Um, start with the people that you know and just, um, that's kind of where the informational interview started from. It's a way of knowing, um, kind of learning from people, but then also you learn of um, job opportunities in the industry um, through those connections. Um, I, <clears throat> I got a job with Ducks Unlimited by, from an informational interview. I got offered a job at uh, the, the Sanger Leadership Center um, from an informational interview. Um, so just coming from that place of curiosity and kind of working with your network and who you know. Um, that being said, um, I also applied to EarthCore, didn't know anyone out here. It was just um, send a resume in on a whim. Um, I think my biggest thing when you're applying for these positions and uh, resumes and cover letters and interviews, um, take some time to reflect on where you're at. You know, you were just in school for four years, maybe more. Um, you've been in school your entire life. Um, as you're making your resume, don't just like put lists of experiences, but think of how those experiences helped you grow, what value they added to your life, and then finding ways to communicate that with the people that want to hire you. Because at the end of the day, people want to hire human beings. They don't want to hire like robots on a magic piece of paper. I, I mean, I guess it depends on what industry you go in. But I think in the environmental industry, people are pretty personal or personable. Um, so yeah, just definitely like in the business world, they call it your strategic advantage, but think of what unique opportunities you've had, what unique, um, perspectives or growth, um, learnings you've had, like think of why essentially like, I think it's fun. I, I love it. Um, it's a great opportunity to reflect and just, I think flipping the script from, I need to brag about myself and that being a really weird thing to reframing that as you get the opportunity to talk to someone about value that you can add to their, um, their company or that position and thinking of it as a way for you to apply um, the skills that you have and that you've developed and continue to grow with them. Um, yeah, that was very meta. Um, I think another thing like take, I keep saying this, but the job perspective, um, application, like it sucks. Sometimes it's a numbers game. You're going to get a lot of no's before you get like the perfect yes. You're going to get a yes that you should think about because it may not be the, like, don't just jump at the first thing that you see. Um, think about it. Um, but know that as you're getting no's or people aren't responding, like, that's not personal. It's, I've talked to the um, hiring coordinator at EarthCore and like, there are just so many applications. This, there's so many people in this field. Um, it's, it's not easy, but I think at the end of the day, um, just putting yourself out there, um, apply for positions that sound interesting and then just chase the leads that uh, develop. When it comes to managing all these opportunities and figuring out where to apply, and then if you do get yeses, which one to accept, what factors do you personally consider when uh, trying to pick which opportunities to engage with? I think, so I think going off of what I was just saying, um, you're looking for growth opportunities um, and ways to uh, kind of distinguish yourself from every other environmental graduate out there. Like what, what makes you unique? Um, which is like such a weird question to answer. It, it almost sounds a little egotistical, but I think being proud of what you've done and you've worked really hard to get to where you are and not being ashamed to find a way to share that story with other people. Um, that being said, I think, um, identifying what what you want you know it starts with having an end goal um 
when I accepted the position at EarthCore, I actually, um, I went from living with my parents post-graduation for three months um, and applying to jobs almost every week. And then all of a sudden I had three job offers in one week. And I um, ended up, so the job with Kyle I took, um, it was a temporary position. Um, I also had an offer at the Sanger Leadership Center um, through my mentor there, uh, my now mentor, at then he was just someone that I talked to. Um, and then I had EarthCore and Ultimately, I chose EarthCore. Um, I'd get paid way less than the Sanger position, um, but post-graduation, I wanted to get out of my bubble. Um, I think, like I grew up in Michigan, I went to school at U of M, that's what I knew. And I think choosing to be uncomfortable is extremely valuable in that post-graduation, like journey of self-discovery, um, definitely, um, yeah, I think push yourself because at the end of the day, growth requires a little bit of discomfort and that's okay. Um, but I haven't regretted it. I moved to Seattle with a suitcase in my backpack, uh, kind of started from scratch, um, had to make new friends. Um, it wasn't easy, but it's the most rewarding thing that I think um, I've ever done. Um, so yeah, I think it's, kind of identify what you really want out of this next step in your life. If you want to expand your, um, your perspectives, um, depending on your financial situation, um, I think that's a decision you have to make. Uh, another big appeal of AmeriCorps was the education awards and that they um, furlough your student loans, which was huge for me. Um, I think, which now I'm at a position where I've been doing AmeriCorps positions and getting paid below minimum wage for three years. And now I'm, I need, um, I'm not going to chase the money, but I need something more than what I'm doing right now um, to uh, take care of myself essentially. So, oh, Sarah did AmeriCorps too. Heck yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, my biggest uh, piece of advice is just identify really what you want out of this next step and then um, find a job that fits that. Sure. In, in, with regard to AmeriCorps, can you talk a little bit about what they're able to do to help with your, your student loans? Like at the end of this, do you get like a certain amount paid off? Has, will that, you know, make up for the, the minimum wage issue? Yeah, so what you trade for um, for like direct income, you get back in um, other opportunities. So um, the uh, most AmeriCorps programs are work skills programs. So um, at EarthCore, um, I came in um, with a wildlife background and was doing plant restoration. Now I know the planting conditions and Latin names of 50 Pacific Northwest plants. I've built, I built a trail bridge. I've built barbed wire fences. I've run brush cutters. I've led volunteer events. I've led leadership workshops. So it's kind of a career development program. Um, and then I also had access to housing resources. Um, I live in a earth core house. Um, with a really good uh, donor and uh, supporter. Um, in terms of student loans, um, they furlough your student loans, uh, which means you don't have to pay them. Um, and then they, have, they also pay off the interest. And then at the end of the year or the term, depending on um, how long you're in the program, um, I think right now it's almost $6,000 um, for one year of service. And that money um, has to be used towards um, furthering your education. So for, in my case, it's student loans, but I have a lot of friends that have done like Knowles courses, outdoor, um, like outdoor education experiences um, and stuff like that. So for me, those, those um, benefits were worth it um, for the first three years. And now 
Um, you're also limited with your AmeriCorps Education Award to two years. So this year I decided to go back and technically it's, I'm still an AmeriCorps member, but I'm not getting the Education Award. So, but the skills and the um, growth opportunities were worth it for me. Got it. Okay, well that's, that concludes all of our student-based questions. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not more student-based questions for the students that are here. So if you want to unmute yourself, um, feel free to jump in and ask any questions you have. I have a question. Yeah. You said you were considering going back to grad school in the near future at some point. Do you feel, um, I guess, uneasy about that at all? I'm considering grad school now and considering taking a couple years off. And I'm afraid that after taking a couple years off my education, I'm not going to have references that I need or the GRE that I need or that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a... Uh... Yeah, there, there are pros and cons, you know. Um, I'm actually very seriously looking at the herb program at U of M again, um, so I might be coming back, which is really weird to say. Um, but um, honestly, having had friends who went straight into uh, grad school and then friends that got a job and then went back, um, I'm on the side of get job experience and then go back. Um, unless you know what program you want and what you want to get out of grad school, um, don't, don't go, you know, don't go to grad school unless you know why you want to go. If you're going just to get another degree and have this cool piece of paper that costs way too much money, uh, don't go. Um, but if you want to learn about something that you can't learn about outside of school, if you want to, uh, work into a network of people that are interested in the same things as you. And if you like, if you want to further your education or if you need to do that in order to get the dream position that you want, um, then absolutely do it. And I, when I graduated, I said I was gonna take a service year and then go back. At the time I was still looking at environmental programs and possibly forestry or like wildlife conservation. I, I had no idea what I wanted to go back for. But at this point when I apply, I know that I want to go back and get a MS in the environment and an MBA. And I want to use that um, towards a career in a sustainable business, um, helping large businesses incorporate sustainable practices um, into their models and essentially going like getting hired by these large businesses and then going rogue and using their giant pots of money to do good things. Um, I didn't know that when I graduated or a year ago. Um, so um, yeah, in, in, the, in the spirit of like trying things out and prototyping, like getting some real world experience, I think can be very valuable. Um, that can be something that you also bring to grad school as well. So yeah, did that help? Yeah, it did. Awesome. Um, so I'm an EB major and I was wondering what EB courses or even environment courses that you took that you'd recommend taking. Um, yes, let me try and um, remember. Um, Ecosystem Ecology with Mark Hunter. Um, is that still taught? Yes, but he's retiring. Yeah, that's um, so Don Zach and Dr. Jacob Algeyer teach it, co-teach it together, which is kind of weird, but yeah. seems to be working. Anyway, you should email him because he's retiring. Anyway. I should. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that ecosystem ecology class, um, loved it. I also... Um, trying to think of the crossovers. Um, I think Johannes's conservation ecology um, counted for both. Um, I was actually in his lizard lab for a year and uh, did uh, research abroad in Greece with him, um, which was another incredible opportunity. Another moment where I went, this is cool, lizards are awesome, but they're all on tiny islands that are gonna 
disappear with climate change. So um, I'm trying to think of other specific classes. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I didn't declare PITE until my senior year. Um, I went to, I studied abroad in Australia. I came back and the classes that they said would count for EV didn't, and they all counted towards PITE. So I was essentially further in a major that I hadn't declared than my original EV major that I declared my freshman year. So my senior year, I just became a like dual major. Um, and luckily a lot of the classes that I'd taken um, kind of transferred for both, so. Yeah, sorry, I feel like I wish I could have answered your question better, but um, at the time I was just trying to figure out which classes would meet all the requirements. I have a question about uh, your current role as a habitat restoration specialist. Is that what it was? Yeah. Um, so I know you're saying you're kind of moving away from that, at least with your grad school path, but um, that sounds like something I'm really interested in. And I know I want to go west, Seattle area. It sounds great. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, like, do you see a lot of other opportunities or other companies doing that kind of work out in that area or did you look around in that industry at all? Yeah, I mean, EarthCore is currently hiring um, core members for uh, 2021. So, I mean, check that out. There's also a Washington Conservation Corps, another AmeriCorps position. Um, they're EarthCore is Seattle based. We do a lot of environmental leadership. Um, they're based all throughout the state um, and are more kind of work focused. There's some trail crews with them that are really cool. Um, there are also a lot of, a couple private restoration companies um, in the Seattle area. But I mean, I guess I'd say if you're interested in restoration and um, the path to project manager, um, Seattle's got a lot of opportunities. Um, uh, yeah. and if. Yeah, if you check out EarthCore or any other organization, just shoot me an email and I'll, uh, I'd love to talk more about it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, I was wondering, like, what would you say the biggest way that your PIT or EEB major played into your uh, careers going forward from your undergrad? Um, yeah, I think um, in the environmental field, uh, being able to show um, your like past experience and education. Um, the, the reality is that it's a very saturated field. There are a lot of people that grew up watching Steve Irwin and want to save the rainforest. Um, and having a degree from a university that's honestly well respected. Um, the U of M network like extends out here. I, um, I've had um, pipe friends that have um, traveled and um, that I've been able to see, but I also have found um, a couple people um, that live in Seattle now that are pipe majors. Um, I go on hikes and see people wearing the block M hat all the time. Um, so um, that network, um, they always talk about it, but honestly, it's pretty cool. You get to say go blue and talk about what brought them out to Seattle. And um, it's just a great conversation starter. Um, and then I think also just in terms of um, the specific classes that you took and um, the experiences that that degree gave you, like I, I I'm very much like being able to say that you graduated on a resume is cool, but that's not very distinctive because a lot of people can do that. But how can you talk about how your experience through PITE and your specialization and the classes that you took and what you were involved in, how can you talk about how that um, added value and makes you, um, I guess, unique and um, helps you stand out. So yeah, definitely 
yeah, know how to talk yourself up and um, think of things that you've enjoyed and um, things that added value um, throughout your undergrad experience and share that with other people. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Isabel. Um, Mike, if you have a Gmail account, I don't, I don't know if you want them emailing your UMish, does it matter? I just put your UMish in, in there. Oh, I'm trying to move away from that. So I'll put my email. Okay. Even though it is cool that you still get a university email, like what, three years later? So I've used that for like discounts and stuff still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyone else have any other questions or? All right, well, I guess we're gonna end on time. It's a Christmas miracle. Okay, well, thanks so much, Mike. And we really appreciate you being our guinea pig for these, this new series we're putting together, um, our, our COVID alumni chats. Maybe that's what we should call it, but <laughs> we'll maybe do it after COVID, right? So yeah. temporary setbacks. Anyway, students that are on, if you have questions for Mike, please feel free to email him. I mean, as you can see, he's very happy to fully and thoroughly answer any questions that you have. If you have questions for me or Chris, um, the peer advisors also can point you to any resources that we have for, I, just speaking from memory, I think, Mike, you connected yourself with some people on our alumni database that were in Seattle that, yeah, that were old Pite students, um, just to yep. try to find a safe place to live and what's the food scene like and, um, those types of things. So there's lots of opportunities to to access resources that Pite already has out there too. So don't hesitate to to ask Chris, me, or any of the peers, Kate, Kelly, Allison. Well, thanks everyone for stopping in.